Hey there everyone, it's me, Aaron, and welcome to a special episode of Comic Class, the show every single week on this channel where we just geek out about comic books. And the reason why I say it's a special episode is because today we are not talking about a comic book. Instead, we are talking about a comic book video game. And I know what you guys might be saying, don't you have another show on this channel where you just talk about video games? Why are you talking about this video game on Comic Class and not talking about on Game Room? Well, the reason why is because over on Game Room, we are going to do an official review of the new Spider-Man game, in which I come in here, and I look at the game objectively, and I balance the pros and cons, you know, all that fun stuff that goes into a review. That's not what we're doing here today. Here on Comic Class today, if you guys have watched for a while, then you know I am a huge Spider-Man fan. He has always been my favorite superhero, so I was indeed looking forward to this game. And when the game came out, I ended up playing it pretty much non-stop until I was done. And as a Spider-Man fan, I had a lot of feelings about this game that I didn't feel were appropriate to bring up in our official review. Because when I review the game, yes, I am going to be looking more at things like the mechanics of the game, the story structure, not really so much, was Peter Parker a good interpretation of Peter Parker? So I thought, you know what? I need to get all these thoughts out. I need to come in here and just talk about how I felt about this video game not speaking as somebody who reviews video games, but speaking just as someone who loves Spider-Man, just as someone who is a massive fan of this character and all of his supporting characters and this entire world, I just need to come in here and talk about my feelings towards the game just as a fan. And that's what we're going to do today, and as you guys can probably already tell, there's no script to this episode. I am just coming in here and completely spitballing all my ideas out there, because when it comes to our review, I want that to kind of be the facts. I want that to just be data, and I figured this one should be all emotions. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm just going to come in here, give you guys my thoughts on the new Spider-Man game just as a Spider-Man fan. Now, before I go any further, let me go ahead and tell everyone, yes, there will be spoilers in this discussion. How much stuff am I going to spoil? Pretty much everything, because I platinum this thing. I didn't just platinum it, I did even the secret stuff that didn't get you trophies in this game. I 100%ed this thing in four days. That is a record for me. I have never gone through a game that quick. In fact, if you don't believe me, here's some footage of Peter Parker swinging around town in his underwear, which is the secret costume that you get for doing everything in the game. So yes, I will be talking about a lot of stuff in this game, not just with the main storyline, but even with some of the side stuff in here. But in all honesty, if you can make it all the way until the end of this storyline, you've probably already had all the side stuff spoiled for you as well. You've probably encountered all of that. So yes, just to let everyone know, this isn't just going to be the big coming straight from the heart, here's how I feel as a Spider-Man fan discussion. It's also going to be our spoiler discussion of the game. So you guys who have not finished this game, Tune out now and come back when you are all done. I will give you guys a second to go ahead, tune this thing out before I get into the big spoilers. All right, everybody good? Okay, here it goes. Oh my God, Otto Octavius is actually Dr. Octopus? Bum, bum, bum. Okay, uh, yeah, we had to get that one out of the way right here at the start because Remember when that first trailer came out? Well, actually it wasn't the first trailer, but the first one that actually showed us like all the villains he was going to be going up against, the Secret Six reveal trailer. And at the end of that trailer, Spider-Man is down and out and he looks up and goes, it's you. And everyone was wondering, okay, who's the mystery villain that's going to be? Oh my goodness, could it be Doc Ock? Could it be Venom? Could it be a Green Goblin? Who is going to be the mystery villain that pops up here? They let you know at the beginning of this game. Like, I don't even feel like that even counts as a spoiler. Like, it's only a spoiler for anybody who has not touched this thing at all. Because this game, it begins with you going in there and fighting Wilson Fisk. But then immediately after he fights Wilson Fisk, he's like, all right, I gotta get to my job. And then he goes to this little lab. And there isn't just, like, an old guy who could possibly maybe be Otto Octavius. There is a guy with four giant pipes behind him 
that are just going in the arm structure around him. It's like, yeah, okay, that's totally, like, there is a silhouette of Dr. Octopus when he first appears. Like, the camera just froze to let you know, this is gonna be Dr. Octopus, everyone. Well, we know who that is. You started without me. The Grant Committee's director will be here soon. Also, man, does he look like Andrew Garfield. It's fine, Parker. I invented this equipment. Not I think him. I can handle it. Him. Power damper. Well, I guess we all now know who's the big surprise villain of this game. And listen, I'm about to get into all my praisings of this game, but I will say I kind of have a problem with the fact that this game kept hammering us over the head over and over again. This guy is going to become Dr. Octopus. And I was like, yes, thank you game, I am aware. I, I know who this guy is. Which, again, it might just be because I did all the side stuff because there are these little missions that you can do in your lab where you have to solve all the little Bioshock puzzles in there. And every time that you solve one, Peter goes, oh wow, look at the tensile strength of this thing. Whatever he's creating could lift something heavy. Oh wow, I sure hope this doesn't get into the wrong hands. Oh wow, I wonder what this thing could possibly be used for. And it's like, Pete, uh, man, who boy, it's me talking to you from the future. Um, you should not be happy about any of this. Uh, it just kind of kept making me laugh that it really was like the game developers like, man, is the audience going to be shocked when this reveal happens? I honestly expected at one point for there to be some crazy ass reveal where Norman Osborn becomes Dr. Octopus or something like that because they just kept hammering in, Dr. Octopus is on the way. Oh, could something terrible be about to happen to Otto Octavius? Oh no, could he possibly turn evil? Then I was like, this has to be like a trick, right? Like you're hammering in way too hard and it'd be one thing if we had just met these characters, if they were characters created just for this game, but we even know this dude from the comics and from the movies and from the cartoons. Nobody's being fooled by this, and yet they kept saying it up like, oh, this is going to be a massive twist. Nah, man, uh, no twist here, none at all. Kind of just the inevitable. So yeah, I will just say right off the bat, just speaking as a fan of Spider-Man, which is what this entire video is about, yeah, that was a little bit bothersome that they just kept trying to frame that like it was going to be a big reveal. It was going to be a massive, oh, look at all the seeds that we planted throughout this game. Yeah, you planted one seed when you just said it's Otto Octavius. We didn't really need all the rest of those seeds. Um, but let me go ahead and actually start talking about Spider-Man in here. And the first thing that I will say as someone who has been reading Spider-Man for well over 20 years of his life now at this point, uh, and by the way, when I come in here and say, well, I've been reading comics for 20 years, that's not me coming in here and trying to be all like, and that makes me the number one official word on Spider-Man. No, that's absolute crap. Listen, the amount of years that you have put into a fan base Fan bases aren't science. If you come in here and say, I've been studying astrophysics for over 10 years, so clearly that means I know more than other people about this, yes, that's fine. If I come in here and say, I've been a fan of this character for over 20 years, that doesn't make me more of an authentic word on that character than anyone else out there who loves that character. I'm just framing this as I've been reading this character for over 20 years to let you guys know, yeah, he kind of means something to me. He's kind of an important big deal to me, and also, a lot of the people out there who read Spider-Man these days, they don't really know anything about him beyond the way that he's been written over the past couple years. And I remember what Pete was like back over a decade ago, back before he kind of changed in tones. And I bring this up because the first thing that I have to applaud about this game is, oh my God, it feels so good to see Pete being competent again. It feels so good to get a Peter Parker who feels like the Peter Parker that I know. And again, Peter Parker has been written a specific way for a decade now in the comics. And I know people are going to say, oh, you're coming in here and you're talking about Dan Slott's run, which lasted for 10 years. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about everybody who has written Spider-Man 
over the past 10 years. Whether he's been on team book, whether he's been appearing in someone else's book, whether he's been in a spin-off book written by a different writer, he's kind of been the exact same way for about 10 years where he's just goofy now. He's kind of just a joke. And I know people are going to say, well, Spider-Man was always a joke. No, no, no. Spider-Man always made jokes. There's a big difference between I make jokes and I am a joke. I make jokes is I tell a joke. I am a joke is I get hit in the face with a pie. That's kind of the difference. And yeah, over the past 10 years, Spider-Man has kind of just been a walking punchline. And again, that's just what's happened. That's just what's happened. It's been a change in tone. It's for a different audience out there. It happens, man. This is comics. Characters are going to change. But yeah, I prefer Peter back when he was competent. And I know people out there are going to say things like, well, yeah, but in the comics, he's also been like a super genius over the past couple years. And he's been running his own company and yeah, you can do big things, but still act like a goof. You can do big things and still just act like a walking punchline. And that's kind of been the way that Peter Parker has been interpreted. And I don't think the writers really realize the difference between being competent and just being someone who happens to do big, important things. Uh, a good example of what I'm talking about is that yeah, Peter Parker, he ran an entire company, but he would give press conferences and then realize that his fly was down the entire time. Or he would charge into battle while having his special car play a dubstep version of his theme song. And it's like, yeah, this just doesn't, it's, you know, it's for a different audience than me. It just, it's not the Peter Parker that I want. But in here, yeah, he's not running some big massive super corporation, but again, I don't define that as showing competence. In here, it opens up and we see that, yeah, his rent is way past due. He's about to be evicted from his home, but the reason he's about to be evicted from his home isn't because he screwed something up at his job. It's not because the universe just turned against him. It's not because an asteroid came down and destroyed his rent check as he was trying to mail it out. It's not because just everything was against him, it's because Peter Parker in this game, he had an option to go and work at Osborne Industries, which would have been a massive six-figure salary that would have bought him like an amazing apartment. Or he had the option to go and work with Otto Octavius and try and do something good for the world. In this little tiny rinky-dink startup science lab in which the two of them are trying to provide some form of humanitarian aid to people. They're trying to create artificial limbs that can actually help people. And I looked at that and went, that's the kind of thing that is Parker's bad luck to me. He chose to do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing just doesn't pay well. But you know what? Peter Parker is not in this for money. And Peter Parker is always in this to do the right thing. And I was looking at that going, that's exactly the kind of stuff that I want to see Peter Parker doing. I want to see him actually trying to use not just his spider powers, but his big brain for the greater good. And I love that the thing he's trying to do here, it's small. It is something that could go on to be something great, but you know, trying to create artificial limbs to help other people. That is such a relatable, real, human thing for Peter Parker to be doing, and that is the other thing about this version of Peter Parker. It's not just that he's competent, it's not just that he's smart, it's not just that he uh, makes good decisions, it's that he's human. It's that every single decision that he makes in here is about helping other people in very real ways. And that brings me to probably my favorite thing about Peter Parker, and also May Parker in this game, which is the Feast Center. I love that they brought the Feast Center in here, which the Feast Center in the comics was a great idea, and then they kind of got rid of it just like real fast, like it hasn't been mentioned in years. But here you see that May Parker is working at this homeless shelter, and one of the things I loved is that Peter Parker, you could have him just walk around the Feast Center, and the homeless people there would interact with Pete, and they all knew him, and Pete knew them, and Pete would ask them about their problems, and how he could possibly help them. Not as Spider-Man, but as Peter Parker. And he would provide them with encouragement. He would talk about things about helping them to get a job or the programs there at the Feast Center that could possibly help them to get back on their feet. And I look at that and went, that is such a real thing. And the thing that always defined Peter Parker to me is that he's supposed to be the everyman. And 
This is not Peter Parker going out there and inventing some new super chemical that could possibly save the entire world. No, it's him coming in here and just trying to help his neighbor, just trying to help his fellow man. And I looked at that and went, that's exactly the stuff that I want to see Peter Parker doing. I don't really want to see Peter Parker going, I invented this new supercar that will provide people with this ability to do this thing. I don't need to see that. I don't need to see Peter Parker inventing a brand new smartphone. I just want to see Peter Parker going up to a homeless guy and going, let me see if I can help you get a job. That's what I love about this interpretation of Peter Parker. I mean, there is a mini game at the Feast Center where you just go around and clean up garbage at the Feast Center. You find a spill on the ground and you just start sweeping it up. And you find three of those spills and you sweep them up and that's it. And there's no reward for that other than just you, the player, feeling good that you helped clean this place up. That's the kind of minigame that should be in a Spider-Man game when you're playing as Peter Parker. It's, hey, you go out there, and sometimes it's not all about just going and beating up the bad guys. Sometimes it's just about picking up the little spills out there. And you get no experience points or anything. As I said, it's just there to show you this is the kind of guy that Peter Parker is. You don't get an immediate reward for doing something other than just knowing, hey, I helped this place out a little bit. It was amazing to me that they would put little tiny things like that at the Feast Center just to show it's important to go out there and try and do good things. Uh, another way that they showed that just brilliantly to me was all the research centers that Harry had set up around the town. And Peter had to go and use these research centers to try and uh, help little bits of the city. Like he would find things like, oh, this water valve is blocked. I have to go and fix that. Oh, these electrical circuits are about to overload. I need to go and fix that. But so many of these little missions were environmental related. And Peter is a scientist. If you are a scientist, of course you care about the environment. And if you're a scientist like Peter who wants to help people and do good for others, yeah, of course you're going to care about, you know, helping the environment as well. So there were so many missions in here in which they would just stop and actually lay like real facts on you about the environment. And it was like, oh man, Spider-Man doesn't just care about the environment. He's trying to teach people about the environment as well. There's lots of little moments in here in which this game just stops to try and get real with you. Like, there was a moment at the Feast Center in which I was just walking past a teddy bear and I was like, oh, I'll click on this and maybe it will be like a little side quest. Maybe it'll start like a little mini game or something. And no, Pete just looks at it and goes, it's hard to believe that so many children are homeless. One in 30. And sadly, Feast Centers like this can't do all the help. We need other people out there to try and do their part as well. And it's literally just the game stopping and turning to you and just going, here is a real world statistic about a real world problem. Do you want to be like Spider-Man and go out there and try and do some good like I do? Man, yeah, that's the kind of thing that Spider-Man should be doing. Spider-Man is trying to help other people. And I have always looked at Spider-Man and as I said a moment ago and seen him kind of as like, the everyman. He is somebody who, yes, he can web swing. Yes, he fights people who shoot electricity out of their hands, but he's always a guy who feels like he still exists in the real world. He's always a guy who he faces real problems. He faces real issues. Like, you know, he's the guy who has to figure out how to pay his rent. He's the guy who has to figure out how to keep his job. And I love that they took that relatability to another level and just went, yeah, great power comes great responsibility. You all have the power to do something about this. You all have the power to help. Like this, the game just stops to tell you this stuff. I freaking love that they did that because it's so in the spirit of with great power comes great responsibility. And so in the spirit of the everyman. So in the spirit of this is stuff going on in the real world. And I know, again, some people might be talking about how, yes, recently in the comics, Spider-Man, he was running this massive corporation, and he did start up a charity organization while he was running this organization, and he did actually have people going out there and dealing with real-world issues all around the world for this charity organization. But again, that doesn't feel quite like Spider-Man to me, because Spider-Man to me was always about what can you do at home? What can you do in your neighborhood? So I really do feel like this game got that message across so much harder than anything that we've seen in the comics recently. Uh, but speaking of the Feast Center, as I said, it was something that was in the comics and they ended up getting rid of it pretty quickly. And I hate that because it was actually a great uh, thing for this character and was something that really could have been explored, but it was gone almost instantly. 
there's a lot of stuff in this game that came from stuff that originated in the comics that they just got rid of in the comics. And I kept looking at in the game and thinking, wouldn't it have been great if that stuck around? And one of those things is Yuri. Uh, not Yuri Lowenthal, the voice of Spider-Man, although I will get to him in just a second, but I mean the police captain Yuri. That was a thing in the comics, very briefly, where this police captain was like, hey, Spider-Man, I'm actually kind of on your side and I'd actually like to work with you. But then they turned her into a vigilante who was kind of bordering on like the Punisher where she was taking her vigilanteism way too far and Spider-Man had to step in and stop her. And then she left the police force and now she's just out there in the wind and maybe she's a hero, maybe she's a villain and now she and Spider-Man can't trust each other anymore. And throughout this game, as you are swinging around and as you are talking to Yuri, all I could think the entire time was, this is so much better than what we currently have in the comics. Where this character you set up, who could have been a massive part of Spider-Man's life, who could have helped Spider-Man throughout the rest of his entire career, is just now gone and might be a villain. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen to her. It feels like this game took so many of the great ideas that they set up in the comics and then just threw away and just went, let's show you what would happen if we actually executed those. Let's show you what would happen if we actually took the idea and ran with it. Uh, so I'm really hoping that when the sequel to this game comes out, because you know there's going to be the sequel to this game, they don't make Yuri a villain uh, or anti-hero like she is in the comics. I hope that they keep her as the police captain uh, and for anybody who goes, well, I find her more interesting as a an anti-hero superhero than as a police captain who helps out Spider-Man. I to me, that's like saying Commissioner Gordon is way more interesting when he's dressing up like Batman himself. I don't agree with that, really. Uh, I think Commissioner Gordon works, works way better as Commissioner Gordon, and that's how I kept looking at Yuri throughout this entire game. Yuri really should be Spider-Man's Commissioner Gordon. And I know some people might be saying, well, Spider-Man, part of his character was that the cops never really trust him. And that brings me to another huge part of this game that I loved. The cops never really trusted Spider-Man because he was new, because he just popped up on the scene, and then J. John Jameson, who was this big respected journalist, came in here and started trying to get the entire city against him. But Spider-Man has done this for years, and he's been swinging around saving people for years, including many people on the police force, for years. Wouldn't eventually people start to trust Spider-Man and people would eventually start to get on his side? And whenever I look at Yuri's relationship with Spider-Man here and how the police are actually working alongside Spider-Man in this game, I keep looking at that and going, this is the benefits of allowing a character to progress. This is the benefits of taking all the stuff that has happened in the history of a character and allowing it to continue and allowing that actual growth and change in this character. And that is the thing that I also absolutely love about this version of Spider-Man. We all applauded Spider-Man Homecoming because they didn't do the origin story all over again, but it's still Pete going back to high school all over again. It's still exactly the same spot where he needs to start every single time. I love that this game came in here and said, everybody knows that Spider-Man was in high school. We get that. What happened after that? College? No, no, no. After that as well. What happened to Spider-Man as he grew and matured and became an adult? You know, like he has been for the past 40 years in the comics. Maybe we should actually explore that. And the reason why people never want to do that when they try and adapt Spider-Man into a cartoon or into a comic book, I'm sorry, not into a comic book, into a movie, is because they say, well, new audiences are going to be confused. This game is going to sell massive, massive numbers. And I guarantee you 95%, and I'm being lenient on that number, 95% of the people who play this game are never in their entire life going to read a Spider-Man comic, ever. And this game didn't stop to explain anything at all and you know something no one's lost 
they didn't have to stop and come in here and explain who all these brand new characters who have never been in the movies or in the cartoons are. No, no one knew that. I mean, they gave an origin story to Mr. Negative, fine, there. But aside from that, like, they didn't need to come in here and explain like Yuri. They didn't need to come in here and explain, oh, Pete graduated college and after working at the Daily Bugle for a while, yeah, every now and again you will find an Easter egg in which Peter Parker will say, yeah, I used to work at the Bugle. But they didn't have to start with that, and you could totally miss those Easter eggs. It's not going to bother you. It's not going to change anything about how you play this game, because they knew you probably all already know that. You've been living with Spider-Man for decades now. All of you know his deal. We don't have to start fresh. We can actually start down the road. It made me think about the Arkham games and how the Arkham games would have been so weird if they started with like Batman's first day. If it was instead of trying to go, oh, we're going into this prison where all of his greatest villains that he's captured over the years are all hiding out. And instead they tried to come in here and just say, Oh, okay, well, it's your first day out as Batman. And you don't know any of your villains. You're going to have to meet them all for the first time on this adventure. Uh, that's kind of what they tried to do with uh, Arkham Origins. But even in that game, they still said Batman had been around for a year. And that wasn't even the first game that they put out. That was more of just there for people who might have been curious about what Batman in this world's origin might have been. It wasn't necessary at all. They didn't need to do that because yes, we all freaking know Batman. So I love that this game came in here and said, guess what? We also all freaking know Spider-Man. Let's actually start down the road with this guy. That was something that I loved about and something that I feel like a lot of other creators out there need to take note with. I feel like it's something that a lot of people out there who keep constantly saying things like, well, we need to start this fresh for all the new readers out there. The new readers already know all this stuff. The new readers already know the history of these characters. It's fine at this point. You're allowed to not set them back at zero again. I will say though, there is one point in this game, in the story, where I feel like them not giving any backstory did actually kind of hurt it a little bit. And that's the start of Act 3, because at the start of Act 3, you have to go to the raft, and then four other villains that have not been seen at all throughout this game break free and team up with Mr. Negative, and then Dr. Ock shows up. And it was kind of odd to me that you have four villains who you haven't seen throughout the rest of the game now become big deals in the third act. Like, again, I'm not saying you need to come in here and give origin stories to each of them. I'm not saying you need to come in here and have Spider-Man talk about his history with each of them. And there are, again, like little Easter eggs throughout this game where the characters will stop and just mention, oh yeah, I remember that time that I fought Electro doing this thing. So it isn't like we don't hear from them at all. They even do mention at one point in this game, hey, these four guys just happened to be at the raft, just so you know. But it is kind of odd that we haven't seen these guys at all, and then all of a sudden they're a major deal in the fourth act. Like, I really feel like in the beginning of this game, when they mention that Wilson Fisk is being sent to the raft, I feel like Spider-Man should have gone there and said, okay, well, I'm going to help escort him to his cell because we all know that he could try something. And you just get like a scene of him like walking through the prison and then you see like all of his other villains in the cells and they like say, hey, I'm coming for you. As soon as I get out here, uh, you're mine, Spider-Man. Like something like that. I feel like if we had just gotten a little thing like that, that would have helped to set them up for the third act. But that's really my only problem with them trying to not set anything up, with them relying on the audience knowing who these characters are. Yes, I know who these characters are, but just speaking in terms of story structure, it is weird that these characters are a major deal in the third act when we haven't actually seen them up until that point. But okay, before I forget, I said I wanted to talk about Yuri Lowenthal as Spider-Man. I am going to say something that I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but again, these are just my opinions. You guys can leave your own opinions down in the comments below. But I really do feel like when it comes to voice acting for the character of Spider-Man, I think, for me, personally, Yuri Lowenthal is to Spider-Man what Kevin Conroy is to Batman. As I was playing through this game, it really hit me. 
this is probably the best voice I've ever heard for Spider-Man. And I know a lot of people out there are going to say, well, yeah, but Batman has a very distinct voice. Superman has a very distinct voice. Wolverine has a very distinct voice. Spider-Man's voice is average Joe. It's regular dude voice. But Yuri Lowenthal nailed that exact perfect pitch of average dude voice but at the same time, he captured every single emotion at the exact level that it needed to be captured, in my opinion. Whenever he was telling a joke, it had that perfect, like, yeah, I'm trying to be funny, but I'm also really stressed out tone to it. Like, Spider-Man, when he makes jokes, yeah, sometimes it's just him being goofy, sometimes it's him taunting the villains, but a lot of times it's also the, I'm tired, I'm stressed out, but I'm telling these jokes to try and get through the day, to try and get through this fight. And there's so many moments in the third act of this game when the entire city is just overrun, when he's telling these jokes, and yet yeah, it really did just feel like he had just had it. He was just tired, he's just done, but that's how he's able to get through this, is just telling these jokes. It's one of the first times that I ever really heard Spider-Man jokes and got that feeling from it. Uh, so yeah, I absolutely think that Yuri Lowenthal nailed every single one of the jokes, every single one of the awkward moments between him and Mary Jane. I thought that he captured Peter Parker's perfect level of awkwardness, because you have to remember that is another big part of his life. Uh, whenever he is trying to deal with his love life, he does just kind of become all left feet. Uh, but also, when it came to the emotional moments, the entire ending of this game, everything from the final fight with Doc Ock, to the big decision that he has to make with Aunt May. Yeah, this is the moment in which we're getting into real spoilers for anybody who was like, well, oh, hold on, until he starts talking about the end of the game. Yeah, we're talking about the end of the game right now. The emotions coming off of that character in that final moment, that's one of the biggest gut punch performances I have seen in any video game. I think he absolutely nailed it, and yeah, Whenever someone asks me who is the best performance you've ever seen for Spider-Man, I gotta go with Yuri Lowenthal now. He is to Spider-Man what Kevin Conroy is to Batman, what Mark Hamill is to the Joker. For me, that in my mind is the best Spider-Man performance. But let's talk about some of the other characters in here. Aunt May, I thought that the actress playing Aunt May absolutely nailed that. Uh, I've always hated the I'm so old and frail Aunt May, the oh my goodness, I have to worry about Aunt May because her heart could go at any minute. I like the Aunt May who gets stuff done. I like Aunt May working at the Feast Center. I think that that is an amazing role for that character to take. So I love seeing her having such an active role at the Feast Center in this game. And I love seeing that, yeah, she goes and she tries to do stuff, like not just behind a desk, but she's actually there helping the people on the floor. I love seeing that interpretation of Aunt May. But, and again, big, big spoiler for the ending, the final moment between Aunt May and Peter Parker at the end of this game, when the two of them are just saying their final farewell to each other, it's not just that Yuri is pouring on the emotion, she is as well. The actress playing that character absolutely nailed like the, it's time for me to go, Peter, kind of expression. The, uh, it's all right, I always knew, and I'm so proud of you. That moment, man, I'm really, my heart strings are starting to get tugged a little bit just remembering this. Uh, I just beat it last night, so the memories are still fresh with me. Um, and speaking of that ending, that was so shocking to me. I mean, you have a Spider-Man game where you kill Aunt May at the end. That is truly surprising and we talk about how oh yeah they set up dr octopus like he was supposed to be a big surprise but he wasn't surprised we all knew that was happening nobody knew they were going to do this at the end of this game uh it really makes me think about how in the arkham games yeah they really did not hold back at least starting at arkham city they would have massive stuff happen at the end of those games and it really feels like Insomniac looked at that and just said, all right, that's how you want to play it? We can play that game as well. It really feels like Insomniac looked at what the Arkham games ended up doing for Batman, and they realized one of the things that made those games great wasn't just all the characters. It wasn't just the giant world you got to explore. It wasn't just the fight mechanics in there. It wasn't just all the gadgets you could use. It was also the stories. 
because the stories actually progressed these characters and actually had traumatic things happen, but it had characters grow because of the traumatic things that happened to them. Yeah, Insomniac did not hold back on this. And it makes me really wonder, oh my goodness, what's going to happen in the next game? Especially with where the post credit scene leaves off, but I'll get to that when I start talking about Norman Osborn. Let's keep going down the list of these characters. Mary Jane, this is the one that I know a lot of people have kind of been back and forth on because they don't know how to feel about. Again, I'll just go ahead and say the actress did an amazing job on Mary Jane. I thought she did great for this character. But the reason why a lot of people don't know how to feel about this is because Peter Parker, you look at this and it's like, yeah, that's Peter Parker. That is exactly what Peter Parker was like for me personally as a guy who read him 20 years ago what he was like back before they kind of made him a clown in the comics. That's the Peter Parker that I remember from when I was a kid. And even if it's not the Peter Parker that I remember from when I was a kid, it's the natural progression of what that character should be. It's where you should take a character who has this background, who has these morals. But when it comes to Mary Jane, yeah, Mary Jane was a party girl supermodel, and in here, she is a plucky young reporter for the Daily Bugle. And yeah, I know a lot of people look at that and they think, well, that's not, Mary Jane has never been anything like that. So I don't agree with this twist for the character because it's so different from who she is in the comics. And to those people, I'd like to say, Ultimate Comics. This is exactly what Mary Jane Watson was like in the Ultimate Comics, if she was allowed to grow up. The characters in the Ultimate Comics, they had to keep them at the exact same age for a hundred issues. For almost ten years, those characters did not age. But Mary Jane Watson, in that universe, even though she was in high school, she wanted to be a reporter. She wanted to be part of the newspaper journalism club. She wanted to actually try and help Peter Parker out. She actually was far more about brains and research than she was about going out there and partying. She wasn't about that at all. And when you think about how she was portrayed in the Ultimate Comics, and you think, what would this character be like if she was allowed to grow up and graduate high school and graduate college and went on to get a job? Where would she work and how would she be acting? Pretty much exactly like this. And again, it is odd to me to see Mary Jane as an adult when she's an adult in the regular Marvel Universe where she is the partying supermodel and see her acting more appropriately for how the Ultimate Universe would be acting but again, I can look at this and say, okay, that's clearly where the reference comes in. That's clearly the version of Mary Jane that they are taking influence from. But even if they didn't take influence from that version of Mary Jane and it was its completely own character, I'm still kind of okay with it. Because A, you can look at her and actually go, okay, well, yeah, I see parts of Mary Jane there, but I also see parts of Gwen Stacy and I see parts of Betty Brandt and I see parts of this character over here. She kind of is an amalgam of every Spider-Man relationship, of every girl that Spider-Man has ever dated, is kind of what the Mary Jane is in this game. But I'm absolutely okay with that because even though I love Mary Jane, I love the relationship that Mary Jane has with Peter Parker. I want those two to get back together in the comics so bad. And by the way, I absolutely loved all the back and forth soap opera. Will they get back together? Will they not get back together? Because Spider-Man has been a soap opera for a long time. Spider-Man has always kind of been part romantic story because it has always kind of been, okay, will this person I'm interested in say yes? Will they say no? Will I start dating this person instead? Will they start dating that person instead? Spider-Man has been a love story for decades now in the comics. So yes, I love that that was actually part of this game. But even though I absolutely love Mary Jane, one problem that I have always had with the character is she gets kidnapped a lot. A whole lot. Mary Jane is always put in danger. So I like this idea of making Mary Jane this game a reporter because it makes her somebody who's far more savvy, far more cunning, somebody who actually has to get herself into danger and then figure out how to get herself out of danger. I actually really enjoyed that there were many missions that you would go on as Mary Jane. And yeah, she would have to sneak into these big bases and actually have to figure out a way to get herself out of there. I really did enjoy seeing them make a Mary Jane who, yes, there is a scene where Spider-Man has to come in and save her. But it was after she does a whole bunch of other badass things and unravels this big mystery going on with Norman Osborn. And up until that moment, 
she had been saving herself mostly. She had been pretty much all right just by herself. In fact, there's one moment in which she goes in there and helps to save all these people stranded by Mr. Negative. Yeah, I enjoy seeing a Mary Jane who doesn't have to rely on Spider-Man saving her. That makes her a far more interesting character to me. So yeah, I am absolutely okay with what they did with Mary Jane in this game. However, I will say, even though a lot of people say that Mary Jane in this game is very different from how she is in the comics, to me personally, I think Miles in this game is very different from how he is in the comics. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that Miles has such a weird backstory because he came from the Ultimate Universe, and then they had to merge his timeline with the regular universe, and we have never really actually explored how he was or what he acted like in the regular Marvel Universe ever since they merged the timelines. So there's just a big blank space in Miles' background now that's never really been explored. So this game actually tells us what Miles is like before he meets Spider-Man in a universe where there is an adult Spider-Man that has been running around for years. So I can't really point at them and be like, well, that's not really how Miles is in the comics because they had to basically create something that the comics haven't given us yet. Uh, so yeah, I'm not really going to point fingers at them for that. Instead, they had to do what they had to do, and I like the character they created. Miles actually has a lot of charming moments in here interacting with Peter, the moment where Peter actually had to teach him how to fight, and then that comes full circle all the way back around. I love that moment. That moment was great. And also, the really just super charming moment when Miles comes out there and he finds out he's part of Team Spider-Man and he's so hyped about it because he loves Spider-Man and he comes out there with a giant basket full of different waters because he's like, I gotta get Spider-Man water. Uh, I don't know what water Spider-Man wants. I'm just gonna grab them all. I'm just gonna grab them all. I'm sure that that'll be okay. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that a person does when they meet their hero. So I really enjoyed the way that they portrayed Miles in here even if they did kind of have to create something brand new for the character. I will say the voice actor for him, I thought his voice was a little bit too high pitched, like he sounded a little bit younger than he looked in this game. But then I went into the files and saw that Miles was 15 in this game, and I thought, oh, I thought he was like 17 or something. So I think it's just that the uh, they designed the Miles in this universe to look older than he actually is. And when I realized that he was only 15, I was like, oh, actually that voice is pretty accurate. That voice is actually what a 15-year-old Miles should sound like. Just, you know, I think that they should have made him look younger in the game, because as I said, he looks like 17, 18 to me in this. Uh, next character I'm going to talk about, before we get into the villains, I'll go with a halfway villain in this game, which is J. Jonah Jameson. I know people have become obsessed online with J. Jonah Jameson's podcast. I think this is a brilliant mechanic that they had in the game. I love that if you went around and you accomplished a side mission, then that side mission would come up as part of his podcast. And there was one moment in which I didn't save someone as I just swung over them because I was like, I've done enough today. I just got to get on to the next mission. And then that person ended up calling into the podcast and saying, yeah, uh, Spider-Man actually swung right by me while I was getting mugged and didn't do anything. And JJ's just like, yep, there you go. Told you guys he's a menace. And ever since then, I didn't fail to do any of the missions whenever they first popped up. If the police radio went off and said that someone needed help, I wouldn't save them because I did not want to be guilt tripped by J. Jonah Jameson's podcast. But I think that this actor nailed him and it also made me realize something. When they eventually cast a J. Jonah Jameson for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston needs to play J. Jonah Jameson because listen to the J. Jonah Jameson podcast in here and listen to those moments where his voice like really peaked when he was yelling so loud that his voice like almost cracked. Now go back to Malcolm in the Middle. Not even Breaking Bad, go back before that to Malcolm in the Middle, to those moments when he was playing Hal and he was just yelling at his sons and the way that his voice would always get so stressed out it would almost crack, it's the exact same voice. He has that exact same voice that the J. John Jameson has in this game. I think he is the perfect guy to play him when they eventually introduce J.J. into the main Marvel Cinematic Universe. And also, just speaking of the character of J. Jonah Jameson in this game, yeah, they made him an insane Alec Jones-style just conspiracy nut. I love how far they were willing to go with that, but I've always kind of hated when that's the only side of J. Jonah Jameson that you get to see, because I always look at J. Jonah Jameson like, 
Yeah, he's a guy who just kind of is broken. But somewhere, deep down, there was a guy who used to be a professional journalist. There used to somewhere in there be that guy who actually cared about the facts and about the American people. And at the end of this game, the very last podcast that you hear from him, when it looks like the entire world is just doomed, when it looks like all Manhattan is about to shut down, when it looks like everything is going wrong, when there are just riots in the streets, when there are the Sable guys running around just walking people up for protesting. I love that during those moments, you actually have JJ coming in here and just saying, yeah, the Sable guys are wrong. The Sable guys are evil. We need to protest them. This is not my America where people can just be locked up for no reason. I was like, oh my God, I'm actually kind of on your side on this one, JJ. And then he comes in here and starts saying, how much did Norman Osborn actually know about this? Let's start examining the facts. And then he would actually examine the facts. I love that at the end of this game, when all the chips were down, when everything was going wrong, the actual real journalism side of JJ actually came out. I always appreciate those moments with J. John Jameson in the comics. I love that they actually capture that in here. And the final message that he gave, right before you go out to the final battle, it was this, I believe in you. I believe in each of us. We can each go out there and help our neighbors. We can each go out there and do the right thing. Stand up there and actually try and help each other. And it's one of the most uplifting speeches in this entire game. And I love that they gave JJ that moment. Because yes, yeah, throughout the rest of this game, he's that complete nut job. But by giving him actually like depth to him, it makes him such a complex character. By making him somebody who isn't just constantly rooting against Spider-Man and constantly rooting for the bad guys, by showing us like the real JJ, the guy that he used to be at the end of this game before he just got driven nuts by Spider-Man, it makes him such a complex character. And it's a character we never even see in the game. You only hear him throughout the game. So they handled JJ perfectly in this game. But all right, going into the villains, I'll start with the guy who they are setting up as the villain in the third game. That is the thing that amazed me about that post credit scene is that, yeah, we all thought that Norman Osborn was going to be the villain of the next game. I mean, you're setting him up. There's even a moment where Mary Jane finds like a prototype Green Goblin mask. And yeah, we all knew exactly what they were setting up with that. He's going to be the Green Goblin in the next game. Got it. But then at the very end of the game, when Norman reveals the big secret bunker that he has, and in there is Harry, and he's got a black goo webbing all over him, and the black goo webbing actually reaches out to touch his dad through the glass, and went, oh, you're setting up Venom. You're setting up Venom 100%, and you are going to have the Green Goblin in the third game, not even the second one. You are planning way, way down the road. I applaud them for that so hard. Uh, but I also gotta say, all this stuff with Harry in here, the moment when Mary Jane actually found out that Harry was sick, when she goes into his room and she just sees all the medical equipment in there, man, that was a heartbreaking scene. And again, it's for a character who isn't even in this game. So I absolutely love uh, how they were able to set up all the mystery surrounding Harry. But when it came to Norman Osborn, yeah, they were able to capture the Norman Osborn being a corrupt businessman side. They were able to capture the just smarmy jerk that he is. However, I love that they gave him depth as well. When you eventually learn what he has been doing all this for, when you eventually learn why he developed this weapon, what it was actually supposed to do, how it was actually supposed to cure Harry, who was dying of the same disease that his wife died of. Yeah, it actually makes you kind of feel for Norman Osborn. And I have not had that experience in almost forever. I had to go way back and remember, oh yeah, right, back before Norman Osborn died, he was kind of a jerk, but there were still those moments where he would like break free of the goblin serum and you would be able to see like, oh no, he actually feels bad about this stuff and he actually kind of does care about Harry a little bit. Uh, they, he hasn't really had that ever since he came back to life, but I understand. It's like, hey man, you come back to life because of the goblin serum, you're too far gone. You've just become pure evil at that moment. It's fully 100% corrupted you at that moment. But back in his early days, 
he did actually occasionally, rarely, every now and again, show that concern for Harry. So I love that they played that up. But even if that was something that never existed in the comics, ever, even if he was always just pure evil in the comics, giving this side to his character makes him so much better. It gives so much depth to his character, makes him so much more interesting, makes him a character that I really do want to get to know more. That moment when Mary Jane finds the tape recorder that just has him talking to his dead wife, oh my goodness, that was a gut punch. There are so many gut punches in this game. Uh, that was one of the most emotional line reads in this entire game, and again, it's coming from Norman Osborn, a character I would not have expected that from. But the villain in this game who gets the most emotional reaction from me, it's Doc Ock. And Doc Ock, yeah, he used to kind of be a good guy, sort of, in the comics until the experiment drove him crazy. Uh, they tell us he used to be a good guy, but we never really see that. In fact, most times that there are, is a flashback to how he was before he got his arms, he was still kind of a jerk. But I was really impressed with how they portray him in this game. And I mentioned long, long ago at the beginning of this video, that when you first see him and they kept hinting at him becoming Dr. Octopus so hard, I was like, dude, we all know it's going to happen. Why are you treating this like it's a twist? And I did have that moment in which I thought, what if it turns out that someone else becomes Dr. Octopus in here and these have all been massive red herrings? One of the reasons I thought that is because I really wanted it to be true. Because this game actually made me really really care about Dr. Octopus more than any comic book ever has. The relationship that he has with Peter Parker is so touching. It's such a great mentor-mentee kind of relationship, but at the same time, Peter is teaching Doc just as much as Doc is teaching him, which I know is a stereotypical line to say about mentors and mentees, but man, was it true in this game. And you can tell how much Peter admires this guy, how he was his hero, and even if you couldn't tell that, they stop and just spell it out for you at the end of this game. At the end of this game, Peter is just breaking down and talking about how we were going to change the world. You and me, we were actually going to do something special. And wow, you can feel the pain that he has seeing his mentor just go off the deep end. But when you see everything that Doc has been through, when you see just what is happening to him, you kind of understand. Like, I kind of hate that they said that the neural interface was actually helping to drive him crazy. I kind of feel like that's a little bit of a cheat. And yes, I know that that's kind of what happened in the comics. But here, when you set up every single horrible thing that has happened to Dr. Octopus, I really do feel like saying, oh, and he got pushed over the edge because his arms kind of drove him crazy. I feel like that's a little bit of a cheat because I feel like you didn't need that. When it gets to the point in which he has his funding taken away, yeah, it's heartbreaking. But then eventually he reveals to Peter that he has a neurological disorder. And by the, this time next year, he probably won't even be able to move his body. All that will be left is his brain just trapped in a body that can't move. And this experiment of his to build artificial limbs, it was all there so that he could possibly still move his body, so that he could have something that his brain could move, the same way that he moves his natural arms. But now the funding was taken away by Norman Osborn, a guy who betrayed him back in college when they were partners and they were best friends, and now he's got nothing left. And now he has to kind of get desperate. And that desperation takes him down a dark path. It causes him to actually form alliances with people who we probably shouldn't form alliances with. Like there is a moment in there, it's a great Easter egg, when he's actually rebuilt the lab and he's gotten all this new tech and he says, yeah, I had to reach out and call in some old favors. And you see that one of the boxes with some equipment on it says AIM, which for anybody who knows Marvel Comics knows, they're the evil super scientist organization out there in the comics. Yeah, when you saw that, I thought, I absolutely buy this now. I absolutely buy him going down the darker path. And what makes that hurt is, again, the voice actor nailed it. 
the voice actor absolutely nailed not just Doc Ock when he goes crazy, when he goes down the dark path and he just decides, I need revenge, I need my arms, I need to get all of this to work. Not just that, but the good Otto Octavius before this, his performance made you care. We were streaming this on Twitch and I mentioned that this version of Otto Octavius, I can't even see this guy turning evil because he's so nice and so sweet, it makes you think he's going to just bake Peter Parker cookies at some point in this game. Like, if this guy ended up, like, hooking up and marrying his aunt, I would actually be okay with that, because, like, you know what? This is, like, the perfect father figure for Peter Parker right now. Go ahead. I'm totally fine with this. So, yeah, I am honestly really impressed with what they did with Dr. Octopus in this game, and it actually makes him one of the best villains in a comic book video game I have ever played. Uh, he might actually be the best. I'm actually really thinking right now of, okay, how good was the Joker again in Arkham City and in Arkham Knight and in Arkham Asylum? How good was he in those? Yeah, he was still pretty good. All right, he still might be number one, but man, Doc Ock is really pushing to be number one right now in my mind. But all right, those are really all the main characters. I've talked about the story in here. Let's just go ahead and talk about the Easter eggs. Let's just finish off by just kind of geeking out a little bit because I was really impressed with all the Easter eggs in here because I had been playing this game for a while. I had been swinging around town for a good bit of time and I hadn't run into any Easter eggs. And honestly, there came a point in which I started thinking, is this some weird thing where they're not legally allowed to use any of like, say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe characters? Is it something where they can only use other Spider-Man characters so there isn't really going to be anything? And then I ran into the Wakandan Embassy, and I thought, oh, okay, that's that's definitely something. They don't even just have the Wakandan Embassy. Peter Parker even makes a line about, I wonder if King T'Challa got his powers from a radioactive panther. So I was like, all right, they're even mentioning that the Black Panther exists in this universe. And then later I found Rand Industries, and I thought, okay, that's another pretty decent one. And then I finally looked up and I saw Avengers Towers way off in the distance and thought, oh, I probably should have noticed that one way sooner in this game. That one stands out. That one lets you know right off the bat that, hey, you are in a world full of other characters. Uh, so yeah, I love going around just finding all the little references that they had in here. Lockjaw as the bull in Wall Street is probably my favorite. I think that was actually an amazing Easter egg they put in here. In fact, one of the creators of this game actually said that legally they were not allowed to use the actual bull that's on Wall Street, so they decided just to go with this. Uh, I would like to argue that we actually replace the bull in real world Wall Street with a giant lockjaw statue. I would like to start that petition. I will say I do kind of wish that we had had maybe one more villain that popped up as a side quest in here because the side quest villains that we get in here, we have Black Cat who leaves you all these little toys all over the scene. You run into Screwball at one point, which I hate Screwball in the comics. I think that she is an awful villain. She is just someone who records all of her crimes for the internet and she just has parkour. That's it, she has no superpowers at all. She's just really good at parkour. And anytime that she like outruns Spider-Man, I always look at that as like, that would be like an Olympic level jogger outrunning the Flash. Like Spider-Man is the master of parkour. That's literally his main way of getting around the city is parkour and web swinging. So I've always kind of hated Screwball in the comics. Here, her power is she is an internet sensation and she has lots of fans. And honestly, that's so much better because it forces Spider-Man to not just fight one person, but an army of rabid fans who adore this internet celebrity. That's way better than I have to chase after this person who I'm faster than. Yeah, uh, it's kind of dumb in the comics, but here, yeah, she was a complete nut job. But honestly, if you're a nut job who is willing to break the law just to get more hits on your internet videos, yeah, that seems like the personality you should have. You should be portrayed as a complete nut job, as a complete psychopath. So I actually kind of liked her more in here, and I actually think the way that her fans actually played into the game was way better than, again, just what we see in the comics of her. 
So yeah, if they ever bring her back for the comics, uh, I would say take some inspiration from this game. But the other big villain who you got as a side quest in here was Taskmaster. Now I will say I have a little bit of problem with the fact that they used Taskmaster in here to force you to do challenges because didn't they do the exact same thing with Deathstroke in Arkham Knight? Did he also pop up in there just to give you little challenges? And I've always said I kind of think of Taskmaster as being like the Marvel version of Deathstroke. So it was kind of weird to me that you have basically the Marvel version of a DC character doing basically what that DC character did in that DC video game. However, aside from that, I don't care because I absolutely love Taskmaster. Taskmaster is one of my favorite Marvel villains and I was very excited to see him pop up in here. And even though, again, it is just him sending you out on challenges and I hated these challenges, they were the one part of this game that I truly did not enjoy from a mechanic standpoint. I still really enjoyed that that's what he forced you to do because just thinking of his character, it makes total sense. Taskmaster has the ability to replicate any action he sees someone else do, so he's setting up all these tasks that Spider-Man has to accomplish that force him to use every single one of his abilities so that Taskmaster can then watch him do this and he can then instantly mimic all of his actions. So yeah, I really enjoyed uh, that that's what they decided to do with that character. Uh, and the final fight with him, yeah, it actually was kind of fun. I did really enjoy that. I love the costume design that they gave him. Again, I'm just speaking as a Taskmaster fan here. I think they captured the character pretty darn well. But alright, I'm sure that there are tons of other things to talk about in here. I'm sure that there's tons of stuff that I'll remember to talk about as soon as I finish recording this. I mean, heck, I didn't even cover any of the costumes that they created for this game, which, those costumes are awesome. It has been a while since we got another Spider-Man game, so it was great to see them actually taking the new costumes from the comics that we have not seen since the last game came out and actually interpreting them into this game. Uh, but yeah, there's so many other things in this game that I really do want to talk about, but that's all the main points. That's all the main stuff that I wanted to say about this game, just speaking as a Spider-Man fan, and also just kind of discussing the spoilery bits in here. I am sure that as soon as I stop recording, I will remember 20 other things that I wanted to come in here and talk about. But let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below. What was your favorite Easter egg? What was your favorite character in here? What was your favorite performance? Let me know all that stuff and more. Let me just know how you felt about this game down in the comments below. But I will finish up by saying this. A lot of people are comparing this game to the Arkham games. And yes, it does deserve to be compared because I believe that the Arkham games kind of laid the groundwork for what we expect from superhero games now. Larger open worlds, lots of side quests involving many other characters from these worlds, lots of easter eggs everywhere, uh, and also the combat system in Arkham was great, and I can't blame the Spider-Man guys for having a combat system that's kind of similar to it, but I would like to remind everyone out there, in the Arkham games, they literally gave Batman Spider-Sense. They literally gave him a warning system that would flare up to let him know when to dodge and when to counterattack. Yeah, man, that's kind of Spider-Man's whole thing, so... It's kind of like saying you ripped off the guy who ripped off you. So, yeah, I'm not going to be too harsh on them about that. But even then, they came in here and they varied up the combat with all of Spider-Man's web swinging, with how quickly he moved, with the distance that he could travel with his movement. They changed it greatly to make it very specific just to Spider-Man. I'm totally happy with that. But the thing that people haven't really said is the biggest comparison between this game and the Arkham games is that both Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4 and the Arkham games are games that take everything that we love about these characters and everything that makes these characters work and takes that over the course of many different interpretations and many different decades of these characters and boils them down into one solid, very accessible game for people who have never experienced the source material. That is the biggest comparison between this and Arkham. And it's the thing that I think that all superhero games really need to strive for. But all right, that's my thoughts. As I said, leave all yours in the comments down below. Or you can always follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Professor Thorey. Or as I said, we actually streamed a lot of this game for people over on Twitch. So if you want to join us for one of our weekly streams, you can follow us at twitch.tv slash Professor Thorey. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time.